He's like a bad smell, isn't he? Or a, or a, a kind of unflushable uh, deposit in the, in the bottom of your toilet bowl. But Boris Johnson somehow managed to insert himself yesterday into, if not the actual news agenda, then certainly the online chatter, the social media chatter. Can you guess what he did? Boris Johnson. You remember Boris Johnson, the one that lied about everything, yeah? And then legged it before he could be held to account by his own parliamentary peers. So he turned up to vote, having been Prime Minister when the legislation was introduced uh, demanding that you come with photo ID when voting, something that if you did vote yesterday you will have observed. And guess what? He didn't have any photo ID with him, so he was prevented from casting a vote. So, I, I mean, there's so many times you think that you've happened upon the most perfect distillation of Boris Johnson's moral corruption or epic incompetence. And then up he pops, like I say, like a, like a bad smell or an unflushable deposit and gives you yet another shining example of just how absolutely awful he is. The prime minister who introduced voter ID legislation for no reason <clears throat> except in the hope of gerrymandering the vote and excluding younger people from the franchise. The Prime Minister who introduced voter ID forgot to turn up with voter ID at a polling station yesterday. And this being Boris Johnson, it, there are three possibilities here. Number one is that he's just stupid and he forgot. Number two is that he honestly feels, as he felt at school, because his headmaster, of course, wrote about it, uh, he honestly feels that he should not be expected or required to abide by the same rules that the rest of us, the same network of obligations. Was that the phrase that his housemaster used? The network of obligations that bind the rest of us. Because that's the thing about networks of obligations. It's not just about following them for following them's sake. These are the invisible frameworks that bind together societies. We all agree not to behave in certain ways. We all, we all agree to, to have sort of uh, respect for certain traditions. And Boris Johnson has never subscribed to that worldview. He c clearly and, and deeply believes he should be exempt from the network of obligations that binds the rest of us, possibly up to and including the necessity of turning up with voter ID as a consequence of a law that he actually passed. Of course, he has a rich record of treating laws he passed with complete contempt, as we know. So option one, epic incompetence. Option two, epic entitlement. What would option three be? Epic narcissism. Could it possibly be that he thought, well, I haven't been in the news for a while, folks, and uh, all the attention today is going to be focused on other other panjandrums and various ah, uh, ah, uh, ah uh, figures? I am uh, going to turn up at the polling station. That was quite good for a while, that impression. It's tailed off now. They always do, my impressions. But I, I think I sort of got about 12% there, did I, in the, in the opening salvos there? I, I, I'm going to... I, I, here's a jolly jape. Here's a wizard wheeze. I'm going to turn up without my photos and see what happens. I'm Boris Johnson. Surely you recognise me. Boris, Boris, Boris. Vote, vote, vote. So that, that anyway, I, I mentioned that in... Uh, sort of as a side order to the question that we're going to begin with today. Mike in Sheffield's gone for option three. He did it on purpose, James, to get into the headlines. Um, and this one's nice from Barbara. James O'Brien is one of the rudest people on the planet. Should he really be allowed to refer to anyone in the way he just has to Boris Johnson? Barbara, this is a trigger warning. I've barely started, so I'm just going to give you a moment to, to retune your radio. To Classic FM is very nice at this time of day. Alexander Armstrong doing a lovely job. We sometimes bump into each other around the toilets here at Global Radio. So, Barbara, just take pop on Alexander, and uh, and then I'll get stuck into the single most disgusting man ever to hold high office in this country, um, not just in my lifetime, but also in yours. Okay. Have a great day. We'll see you. I may see you on Monday. I may not. Tuesday. Tuesday. Seven minutes after 10 is the time. So I mentioned Boris Johnson, and quite a few of you are going for option three, two, and one, all at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. You can't, it can't be option one and option three. He can't be epically incompetent and deliberately doing it in order to garner attention. Um, Andy, my impression of Boris Johnson did not sound like a Geordie. I grant you that a lot of my other impressions do, particularly my attempt at a Scottish accent, but that, that, that one is, I'm with Tom on this one. He said, fantastic impression, James. And, uh, and Sarah has paid me the highest compliment possible on LBC Radio. She says, that, that impression was better than Nick Abbott's. Thank you, Sarah. I shall hold that close to my heart for the rest of today. So I've talked about Boris Johnson there for four or five minutes because the question I'm going to ask you involves him. It involves a general election result in 2019 
which saw the Conservatives romp, to use a word I'm sure he rather likes, well, in fact, a, a, a hobby he rather likes over the years, but the Conservatives romped. One of those words you only ever see in newspapers. No one ever uses that word in real life, do they? What did we do? Should we, should we have a bit of a romp this weekend, darling? Boris Johnson and his Conservative Party, although it was very much a Boris Johnson-defined Conservative Party, not least because they'd slung out almost everybody honest, or at least everybody prepared to be publicly honest, or sacrificed them upon the altar of Dominic Cummings' fever dreams. God, there's a name we haven't said on the radio for a while. So... Boris Johnson romped to an enormous victory in 2019. And there was a sense abroad that the Tories were bedding in for generations. The Labour Party was in complete disarray. The Labour Party at the time was a circular firing squad. The parliamentary Labour Party had been led for the best part of a half a decade by a man who most of the parliamentary Labour Party, for good or for ill, today's not the day to relitigate that conversation, but most of the parliamentary Labour Party considered him to be a liability, even as they were compelled by either principle or ambition or a combination of both to campaign for him to become installed in Downing Street. So the Labour Party was in complete disarray. The idea when Keir Starmer became leader that he would be able to transform the party at all, never mind this quickly, into an eminently electable operation, was fanciful. It was pie in the sky. I, I interviewed him. When did we do the interview at the Leicester Square Theatre with him? That was when I just found, my first time I had personal contact with him, and I just found myself thinking that... Um, he, you know, yeah, maybe he can do something here. Maybe he can turn this oil tanker around. But what, of course, you didn't take into account when you were contemplating Keir Starmer's prospects, Keir Starmer's electoral prospects, was the other side of the coin, of course, which is a Tory collapse. So how much of the Labour Party's current good fortune is down to the Labour Party's current good politics and how much is down to the Tory party's sort of hemorrhaging of support and credibility in equal measure? I do not know. I don't know who does know. Maybe you do, in which case it's time to remind you that the number to call is 03456060973. Because the question I'd like to ask you is, how much of this is Rishi Sunak's fault? I, I had a bit of a revelation this morning. Actually, Eleanor did, the producer, but I'm stealing it and passing it off as my own. I, I, because, it, you, you know, I've, I've written in my new book, in the paperback of my new book, which has a chapter on Rishi Sunak, about how... Your, any hopes you had that he might be signalling a reversal of moral corruption or epic incompetence, the sort of Boris Johnson, Liz Truss cocktail, disappeared the minute that he put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office. But that's the, that's the woolly liberal hoping against hope that Sunak would somehow turn out, out to be made of better stuff than the Prime Minister under whom he'd served as Chancellor or the woman who had beaten him to the leadership. That that was the woolly liberal, the, the naive centrist, the centrist dad, whatever phrases you like, what other phrases you prefer. The, 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 the You know, people like me, really, looking at Rishi Sunak from quite a myopic angle, a myopic perspective, looking at a single issue, really, of sort of personal credibility or personal... Eth ethics almost, and, and, and thinking he must be as disgusted by what's gone on under Boris Johnson morally and what's gone on under Liz Truss fiscally. He must be as disgusted as, for example, I am or you are or we all are, and therefore he will want to undertake a significant sea change. He will want to put clear blue water between himself and the two who went before, even though with the first one he... Served as Chancellor of the Exchequer, the second most powerful person in government. And that's what we were signing up for as people who were never, I speak for myself here, someone who is probably highly unlikely and impossible, in fact, to imagine any circumstances whatsoever in which I would vote Conservative in a general election. Unless I had a, an individual MP who was completely, somehow completely detached from the, like a sort of conservative equivalent of Jeremy Corbyn back in the day when he was a backbencher, if you like, and they'd managed to secure such a huge personal following and such a huge personal success rate that you could completely abandon party loyalties and you'd be working on the presumption that the party you wanted to govern were going to win anyway. You could completely abandon party loyalties and, and cast across, um, cast a vote according entirely to the attributes of the individual candidate. But 
He didn't, did he? He, he? he appointed Suella Braverman back to the Home Office and we immediately found ourselves going, oh, crikey, he's just as bad as the rest of them. But that won't have resonated beyond the centrist dad, the, the, the woolly liberal circle. There, there's no, no one in the red wall who liked Boris Johnson's lies and liked Pretty Patel's rhetoric about small boats or Suella Braverman's rhetoric about brutalising refugees. No, Nobody there, none of those votes will have been lost when he put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office. So that analysis, albeit that it's now published in black and white and available in all good bookshops, uh, I think it's even on Waterstone's buy one, get one half price offer this week. So that analysis, although completely accurate, is skewed towards people like me. It's skewed towards the woolly liberal, the centrist dad. Oh, Rishi Sunak, hey, things went wrong for him the minute that he put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office. But that's not true. Because if he hadn't put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office, I still wouldn't be voting for him if we ever get around to having a general election. And and that simple observation, which my producer arrived at this morning, that simple observation opens the door to the possibility that none of this is Rishi Sunak's fault, or that not all of this is Rishi Sunak's fault, or that only... A little bit of this is Rishi Sunak's fault. An epic collapse in the space of five years. So that's three prime ministers, five years, and from a historic win, historic win, worst in 80 years for Labour, to a historic loss overnight, looks like being the worst in 80 years for the Conservatives. Different measures, different natures of elections, but still striking in terms of that span of decades. How much of this... Is on Rishi Sunak. 